All right, so once again, welcome to Accounting Chapter 1, Introduction to Accounting, okay? So in this case, these are the topics that we are going to be learning in accounting, right? We're going to learn the very fundamentals of the basic principles that governs why we do accounting, which is the generally accepted accounting principles. We're going to talk about how we actually collect, record, journalize, post them, and making sure our accounts are balanced, right? We're going to be dealing with the accounting equation, which is going to be why we balance our books so we can satisfy the accounting equation, which is the assets equal liabilities plus equity, okay? We're also going to be learning as a merchandising type of operations, okay? So that's our main goal is we're going to look at how we generate profits through our sales, okay? And how we, in order for us to generate the sales, we need to also look at purchasing inventory, right? Collecting sales, sales tax, okay? We need to deal with all of those criteria, okay? Other things that we're also going to be looking is going to be creating our financial statements. And last but not least, we're also going to deal with payroll, okay? So these are the basic fundamentals that you should know and we're going to learn in this class to understand the very basic structures of a very small retail business, okay? We're going to learn all of these aspects, okay? Now let's talk about business organizations. What kind of business organizations exist under accounting? First off, let's talk about understanding what is the main core of all business organizations, which is going to be the nature of a business, right? To sum this all up, we understand that the main goal of all businesses is to make a profit, right? So how are they going to be making a profit? By um, taking a look at a business, okay, that uses its basic resources, right, and labor to create a product or a service um, to be sold to consumers, right? That's the goal of the business, okay, which is going to be maximizing profits while at the same time maximizing savings, okay? So again, in a real short terminology, right, think about any kind of business that you know. The goal is to make money and make, make money while spending less money to operate in order to make a huge profit, right? The main goal is you're trying to provide a service or provide a product that could be sold for a higher price when it costs you significantly less to produce it, okay? That is the nature of a business, okay? Now, again, these are the five types of business organizations that does exist right now. There are a couple that do exist beyond the borders of this, but these are the main five that we see present here today, okay? Number one is going to be sole proprietor, right? Uh, number two is going to be a partnership. Number three is going to be a corporation. Then number four is going to be a limited liability company, also known as an LLC. And of course, last but not least, we also have our nonprofit organizations, right? Um, they are usually named other things, right? NFOs for non-for-profit or non-profit uh, no, uh, NPOs, right? So we're going to talk about all three organizations and what they do and how we differentiate between the different organizations what are the pros and cons between them and then last but not least right we're going to talk about um which one of these organizations that we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this class okay so let's go ahead and dive right into sole proprietor right Sole, meaning one, proprietor ownership, okay? So in this case, a sole proprietor means there could only be one person that owns the company, okay? 
if another person owns the company, it's definitely not a sole proprietor, right? It becomes a partnership, right? Hence the word partnerships, right? So in this case, a sole proprietorship means only one person owns the company, okay? Now, if one person owns this company, right, that means the owner and the business are one, okay? They are viewed as one, they act as one, so that means everything that the business owns is also going to be subject to also be subjective to the person who owns it. So that means anything that happens to that business, the owner is 100% responsible for all the business activities. So in this case, right, you own a business, that means you're fully responsible for everything that happens to that business. So if you make all the profits, that profit is yours. You make a loss, you have to take that loss, it's yours. You um, have to spend money for the company, you have to do it on behalf of yourself. So if your company goes down, so does, so does everything else that you own personally also goes down as well, okay? So that's the huge, huge risk of opening up a sole proprietorship, okay? So anything that happens, that means the owner owns all the assets, liabilities, and equity, and earnings. So in this case, we'll talk about what assets, liabilities, and um, equity are, okay, in a few moments. But in this case, the business and the owner are one, okay? So that means, what, what do you mean the owner and the business is one? In the eyes of IRS, okay, meaning filing for taxes, they file as one, okay, or they are viewed as one. So anything that you own and anything that the business owns is going to be in regards to one person, okay? Now, here's a fun fact that you do need to know. So um, anybody can say they can own their own business, right? But in reality, of course, the government's not going to, um, you know, let you get away with that because owning a business means you get to have a huge tax write-off. Now, a big, prevent, uh, a big way to prevent those kind of situations where people make up their own companies just to be able to take um, those tax deductions is if you are going to be claiming yourself as a sole proprietor, you must make a profit three out of the five years you're doing business or else the IRS is going to deem you guys as a hobby, okay? That is very, very important to know because like I said, right, anybody can say I own my own business, right, because I do it to take, to, to take myself a tax break. No, 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 no. It's not that easy. You can't, you're not, anybody can do that, right? Anybody can say that I own my own business and I do it for the reasons of writing tax off. No, that's not um, the best way to do it because, again, if you don't meet this criteria, right, all those tax deductions that you've taken, right, going on forth, you must pay a higher tax because it's not a real legitimate business. It's a hobby that you're doing. Okay, so that's the huge, huge criteria. It's a huge threshold that you have to meet in order to be existing as a separate business entity and be continuing writing off those taxes as a business. Okay, that you must make th profit three years out of the five that you do your business. Okay, so that is very, very, very huge. So let's talk about the advantages versus the disadvantages, okay? Advantage number one, it is the most easiest form to establish yourself as a sole proprietor. Obviously, you can't just say, hey, one day you wake up, I am my own business. No, you actually have to file it through the um, state um, and local agency, of course. Um, there is a website for that. In this case, um, here in Nevada, I believe it's uh, Nevada uh, something, um, Nevada business or something like that, where you just simply pay a small fee 
and you apply for a business license and if you get approved usually the process is um within 30 days you would get recognized whether you get approved to even become your own business now of course it's not as easy as you can you think of right you have to you have to have collateral okay and you also have to be approved of the bank to see if you have um you know, if your credit score is good enough to be able to open up your own business. So it's not like you can wake up one day and just be like, apply for a business license and be able to get approved, right? There are other features and criteria that you must have. But it is the easiest, right? Because all you got to do is just pay a simple fee, submit the form through the uh, website, and they will send you your business license within 30 days. So it is the easiest way to formulate a business. So straightforward very simple very easy can be done online in 10 minutes okay of course number two that means the owner has full control of all the decisions um to run the business right for those of you who um do not like to work under somebody well here's the perfect opportunity for you to become your own person the own person that does makes all the decisions right um but again um if that's an advantage because that means you don't have any other influence to to make you know executive decisions that might not be good for the company right that means anything that goes with the business they have uh you know the owner has full control of every aspect of the business so if you like your business to be run a certain way you own the business you make the calls that's the advantage of owning your own business is you have full control of everything, okay? Third thing is that owners can keep or reinvest the profits, earnings from the business. So that means every penny that the business earns in profit, okay, minus all the expenses, right? If you have money extra from all the sales, you can choose to pocket that, um, that money, right? You don't need to reinvest it into the company but again if you are a small business the better decision would be to reinvest into your company because then more investments into your own company the more chances you're using that money to expand so you can make even more money so um but at the end of the day every penny that the company makes in profits the owner gets to take it 100 percent Okay, or they can choose to reinvest it back into their company. And then number four, personal tax deductions. Like I mentioned, right? If you're your own business, you get to write off a nice tax deduction off of your personal taxes because you own a business. Meaning a lot of those expenses and all those costs, right, is going to be contributed to your business. So the government takes it as a personal tax deduction. So again, huge advantage, okay? And then last but not least, it is also easy to dissolve, right? You can quit a sole proprietor. You can close up your business at any given time, right? All you have to do is just close your business bank account and that's pretty much it, okay? Obviously, if you have your own store, you just sell your store, you sell its assets, you sell everything that is in the store, but it's really easy to determine. All you have to do is call or send a letter to the state to say, I'm done, I don't want to do business anymore, and it could be easily dissolved, okay? Pretty straightforward, okay? Now, what are the disadvantages of that? Well, if you and the business are one, okay? That means you are 100% responsible for any paying, uh, for any for any liabilities or anything that happens to the business. So that means you are at risk, including your personal assets, right? Because if you and the business are one, that means anything you own for the business, is the same thing as anything you own yourself. So if you ever seen those movies where um, you see um, a business owner right there, you know, going, their business is going down, and you see that their their car is gets repossessed, that house gets repossessed, there that's all because 
they're using all of those items as collateral, right? As a means to what happens if the business goes under. Well, that means your house that you own, your car that you own, it's all at risk. So that's why that's the one huge thing about going into business is if you are going to establish yourself as a sole proprietor, that is the dangerous and that is the risk of owning your own business is that means everything is liable, right? Because you have to have some kind of collateral for you to be able to open up your own business, okay? And of course, all um, business and personal assets are at risk, I just mentioned, right? So if you even choose to make a really bad executive decision that puts you in the hole, right? The only person that's going to be responsible for that is the owner, okay? Because the owner made that decision, so the owner has to be fully responsible into um, paying back that liability or whatever the situation is, okay? That means all business and personal assets are at risk, okay? Of course, it's also going to also be limited to be using only personal savings or consumer loans. So again, especially when you own your own business, right? You need to prove to the bank that you're able to take a small business loan out by making sure that whatever your collateral is, is good enough or whether your spreadsheets or your, um, you know, you're showing that you're making a profit can prove to the bank that you can handle a loan, okay? Now, again, Small consumer loans are very small. They're about like maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. They're not that big, um, and it's also based on your credit score too. So, um, if you have a really bad credit score, then you're one hundred percent you're not going to be able to open your own business unless you have your own personal savings saved aside for you to be able to do a to build your own business with that money. Okay, so it end, so at the end of the day, that's a disadvantage because. You're not able to get yourself started unless you have some kind of um, original investment or you have the means to be able to borrow money from the bank for a small business loan um, to get your um, company up and started. Okay? And number four, it does not attract high caliber employees. Okay. We'll talk about this more in depth in chapter 12, which is going to be 10 weeks from now. But what does it mean that it will not attract um, uh, high caliber employees? This is because, again, when you're starting off a small business, right, you have to manage your money very carefully. And there's, there's one thing that you won't be able to do unless, you know, you have the money to be able to afford it is... Can you afford the cost of having employees? And if you pay them on a regular basis, right, can you afford to pay into their, their um, retirement benefits, right? Anything that you want to give to your employees as a way to um, have them work for your company, right, uh, reward them, right, then that's going to be costly, right? If you're going to be pitching into their 401k, that's money that you're going to be putting into every single paycheck you pay for your employee. And especially when you're a small business, you might not be able to um, be able to offer those kind of benefits to your employees. So if you can't protect your own employees, then the people that you're hiring, they're just probably going to be hiring for a temporary position. They're only going to be there just to work, to get the experience, and that's pretty much it because if they know that they're not getting any benefits from working in this company, they're not going to work there, right? They're only going to be using that company to build their experience work profile. So most likely you're not going to get a high cal caliber working employee, right? All right. And then last but not least, number five, employee benefits are not fully deductible to the business. So again, as a sole proprietor, right, a small business owner, there are some rules and regulations on getting tax deductions on um, having employees. Some of them are not t tax deductible, meaning that you can't take, um, you cannot 
be taking any deductions from your taxes uh, because you have your goods, right? Not all of them are going to be um, deductible, right? Any questions in regards to sole proprietors? Nope. nope. All right, right? So in this case, right, sole proprietor is what we're going to be taking a look for in this class because, again, we're looking at the very fundamentals of a small business. There's no point to be jumping from a large from a small business to a large business because you need to know how to run a small business to begin with to understand in a corporate level of their positioning, right? Everything is separated. It's segregated into specific criteria of a company. In this case, for a small business, you're able to do all the positions in one because it's not super massive, right? It's not to the extent where, um, you know, you're dealing with a million employees or you're dealing with a million customers, right? You're only dealing with a small group of individuals, okay? And you're not going to have that many um, things to have to deal with, um, especially for a small business. So this is the type of business we're going to be taking a look at is a small um, business owned uh, type of entity. Okay, for this class. Okay. Next one's going to be partnerships. Okay, partnerships is where you're going to have more than one person in owning the um, entire company, okay? So this is where this is where it's going to be split into two different types of partnerships, right? You have a general partnership and you have a limited liability partnership, okay? So let me tell you what the difference between the two is. Now, under a general partnership, it's where two or more, yes, you can have more than two partners, Okay, you can have three, you can have four, you can have as long as it's more than two people, okay? And the criteria here is that when you're in a general partnership, everything is going to be distributed based on an agreement, okay? So if you have two partners, then the work is going to be evenly distributed. 50% of the work is going to be done by one partner. The other 50 is going to be uh, done by the other partner. If you have three, you know, 30, 30, 40, right? Whatever agreement you guys agree to is going to be determined that everybody is going to be a contributing feature to the company. If they're going to own the company, they're going to split up the work within the company. And, of course, with that too, they're also going to be splitting the profits, okay? And it's going to be written on a piece of paper, obviously. You're going to go into a partnership, right? You're going to make your agreements. You're going to get that much profit. I'm going to make this much profit, okay? So that is a general partnership, okay? Now, what's the difference between that and a limited liability partnership? So you guys might have seen this around, right? The LLPs are not the same thing as LLCs, okay? They are completely two different entities, okay? A limited liability partnership means there has to be at least one general partnership and the other partners act as a silent partner. Okay, so that's where, oh, that's where that terminology comes from. What does a silent partner do? Well, the silent partner has wants to do nothing with the operations of the company, but their main role is to invest the money into the company. And all they do is collect profits, okay? That's the difference between a general partnership and a limited liability partnership is you need to have at least one person who's going to be managing the entire company on their own and you're using the other partner to come in and help with investing into the company, okay? And they're strictly only responsible for just collecting the profits because if they invested the money into the company, they're expecting to take money away as a profit, okay? So again, 
You can have one general partner and two silent partners, right? You can have two general partners and one silent partner, okay? As long as you claim in the limited liability per, uh, uh, partnership that one person has to at least be the general partner that runs the entire operation of the company, okay? So, again, um, that is the difference between the two different types of companies, okay? All right, straightforward. So let's talk about the advantages versus the disadvantages of going into a partnership. Number one, of course, it's easy to establish a partnership. However, it takes time to build the agreement policy, okay? Because it's not like you can say, hey, hey, um, you, you and I, since uh, we're, we're going to class together for business, how about you and I go into business? No, 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 no. Because if you're going to do that and not make an agreement, right, you guys are going to have trouble in the future because you guys have to go through how are you going to split the profits? How are you going to split the task? How are you going to uh, determine what task each person does? What is your position? Okay, what are you contributing to this? Are you going to invest some of your money into the company? You need to make those agreements because future in the future, down the line, right? When you have to come across those executive decisions, right? You have to make an agreement to make sure that both partners are both in agreement and not one person is taking advantage of the other, okay? So this is where most commonly a lot of partnerships do go down um, because of the agreement that they formulate. And of course, it's not like you can say, okay, you take 50% of the profit, I take the other 50, you do 50% of the work, I do the other 50% of the work. What does 50% of the work entail, right? Because your partner could be like, yeah, 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 I'll do that. But at the end of the day, it has to be some kind of signed contract agreement so that does involve a lot of time to lay out all the rules into what each partner is expected and what they want. Okay, and again, you have more chances to be able to uh, to obtain funds, right? Because if you have two partners, two partners can get two loans, right? So therefore, you have the capabilities of generating more income, right? Also, right, one person could be a sole strictly person that is a sales representative that goes out on their own, tries to sell the product for you while you have someone at the store location trying to sell the product to the local individuals, right? You have the abilities to increase your profits or increase your funds much quicker than you were to be alone, okay? And of course, tax deductions for profits. Yes, both partners get to take advantage of that, okay? So that's a win-win for everybody, right? And of course, hiring employees that may become a potential partner. So for instance, right, let's say you have um, a small mom and pop shop, right? They don't have any kids, so that means they don't have anybody to pass the um, company down to any of their lineage, right? They just don't have anybody, right? So in this case, right, they could have a loyal employee that's been working there for, I don't know, maybe 25 years, and they can say, hey, you know, we're, we're about to retire. Are you interested in becoming a potential partner for the business? If you are, then you just sign your contract agreement, yada, yada, yada. And then that way, right, it would most likely, um, you know, entice a lot of employees to want to work for those kind of mom and pop shop companies because they have the possibility of becoming a potential partner. Okay, over time. Okay. So that's the advantages of partnerships. What are the disadvantages of partnerships? Okay. Again, they are responsible for each other's actions and decisions. Okay. So that means if your partner decides to make a decision, right, and you agree to it, and this decision caused you guys to lose a lot of money, well, you know, 
you're responsible for their decision, right? Because you guys both agreed on it. It was a bad decision. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to, you, you're going to have to go through that. So that means both of you are going to be having to share the responsibility for one person's action. Now, here's a little fun fact. If you guys are in a meeting, right, you guys have to make an executive decision. If a partner decides to make that executive decision without the other partner knowing, that partner can revoke that person's decision because both parties must agree. They both have to know what the agreement is. If one person decides to agree without letting you know, that person can revoke that decision, okay? But let's say if both party knows, okay, and that person just happens to go on a business trip, right, and that other person is in that meeting to make that executive decision, but you guys both agree on it, then that decision is final, okay? So that's a fun fact. So if for any case that you have a sense that your partner is, you know, doing some uh, something behind your back or something like that, at least you have that jurisdiction where you can revoke their decision if you did not know they made that. So that is pretty cool, right? And of course, number two, profits are shared, right? In this case, you're going to be having to share profits with that other partner, right? In most cases, it's an advantage if, you know, you're the sole proprietor because you get to take all the profits. In this case, it's a disadvantage because you get either, you have to share those profits. So you either take your 50%, if it's three or more people, then you take 30%. So again, you kind of get the idea, right? You wouldn't be able to make as much money um, from profits as if you were to go into a partnership, right? And of course, number three, disagreements are going to be, once again, inevitable, okay? Um, it's just like any kind of partnership, whether it's, um, you know, a significant other, right? You're going to always disagree on something because every individual person has their own idea of what they expect from a partnership, right? They expect this, they expect that. So in this case, some of those expectations cannot be met and disagreements can happen and sometimes those disagreements can lead to a partner leaving the company right um yes hold on yes go ahead so um you were talking about the difference between the generic um partnerships and the limited partnership and then limited partnership that you said of the silent partner usually doesn't haven't wouldn't do much for the daily business transactions mm -hmm. and the decisions but they want the business to make a profit so um where you are saying about disadvantage those um silence partner will put their um ideas and the decision into a uh, business decision making or they stay silent meaning if the general partner makes the decision they just go with it well that will also be um included in the contractual agreement right does oh, does okay. does that silent partner want to mm -hmm. be involved in the decision making then that's going to be something they have to rule out if if the silent partner wants to just strictly be completely out of it and only wants to just invest their money in it and not has not doesn't want anything to do with the good business that's going to be in the agreement Okay, so mm -hmm. it's completely up to the decisions that they made. Oh, yeah, completely. So it, it has to be, okay. I mean, it would be recommended to have it written down and have each yeah. partner contracted and sign that contract, right? Because then yeah. that's legally binding. If it's verbal, anybody can say yeah. anything, right? Yeah. So that is, so again, disagreements can happen if that silent partner says i don't think that's a smart move yeah then they can have jurisdiction right saying if it's written in a contract saying that they can contribute their decision making then that's mm -hmm. going to be something that can be a conflict between the two 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's not just only general partnership I'm just talking about. I'm talking about in uh, both of them. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And some employee benefits are non-deductible. So once again, because it's a it's um a partnership is very similar to a sole proprietorship, right? The only difference is there's two people involved in this, but again, they're all responsible and uh for um whatever actions that they do. Okay. Um and again, because part three can lead to a partner leaving, that will basically give them a limited lifespan. Okay. Because again, the criteria is if you if there's only two of you and that partner decides to leave, right? You either one need to be uh become a sole proprietor and work the business on your own. Two, you would either need to find another general partner, or three, you're going to have to find a silent partner to just help you invest to maintain the status of a partnership, okay? So that's why there is such thing as a silent partnership because oftentimes when a company does go into partnerships and that person ends up leaving, you know, This person wants to run the show themselves, so they would end up looking for a silent partner to strictly just help them out with just the investments, okay? So they can still file as a partnership, all right? So, um, again, um, that is going to be a disadvantage if a partner does leave because then your partnership is no longer a partnership until you um, either find a new partner or you demote yourself and become a sole proprietor. Okay. Any other questions in regards to partnerships? Nope. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to the big businesses. Okay. So corporations are going to be, um, you know, you actually see more corporations uh, more prevalent um, nowadays just because a lot of things that we know today, um, things like Target, things like Walmart, right? They're all corporations, right? They're all big major companies, including McDonald's, right? McDonald's is a huge, huge incorporation, right? In these kind of cases, we have to understand what makes corporations different from a small business owner versus a partnership. Well, in this case, right, nobody owns the business, right, because everybody owns the business. Okay, so here for corporations, as we know, it's a huge publicly traded company. They have four characteristics that make up what a corporation is today okay starting with the first one is because again since nobody owns the business because everybody owns the business right how does everybody own the business they own it by owning a piece of share okay a stock okay so um that is a criteria of a corporation is because it's a publicly traded company they're looking into people who believe in that company to want to invest their own money and their fair trade-off is that hey if you invest money into this company we'll pay you back by saying you own a part of the company and we will give you your money back through dividends okay so that's the fair trade-off of owning um, a part of a company is by owning some stocks of the company, okay? So in this case, the actual business itself is its own as separate entity, okay? Because because nobody owns it because everybody owns it, right? Second thing is going to be a central management. So AKA a board of directors, right? We all hear that a corporation is run by a board of directors. Now, how does this board of directors come to be? Usually, there's a shareholders meeting that anybody who's involved in that company that owns um, a certain amount of percentage of the shares, whether it's one share or they own 50% of the shares, they all have to 
um, come together to a shareholders meeting to elect these people to run the business. Now, the people who run the business do not necessarily have to own any stocks, okay? They don't have to be part owner of the company whatsoever. However, they do get elected. But in most cases, it's usually the people who own the stocks usually are more willing to want to run the business, okay? Now, again, these board of director, directors do not do anything unless the shareholders agree on it. So here's the thing. It's, um, it's, very, it's very similar to democracy where you have people who represent the, the owners of the company and those people are going to make those decisions for on behalf of the company to either uh, invest in more, more profits, invest, you know, have more advertising, have more sales, create another department. It's all being run by the owners of the company, which is the shareholders. So they do have a shareholders meeting to go over all of those um, business executive decisions. And usually, depending on the company, right, they usually either do it um, once a year, at least once a year, or they do it every quarter, okay? It just really depends on what those decisions are, okay? But that's what uh, the board of directors are elected by the shareholders themselves, okay? And, of course, number three is going to be transferability of shares, okay? Again, so, again... Profits are distributed through dividends, so meaning any person who owns a stock will get a fair share of the money that the company profits. So again, um, that is what transferability of stocks is. And again, of course, right? If no, if that person doesn't want to own the stock anymore, they just sell that stock either back to the company or sell it to another person who's interested in. Um, investing into that company. So pretty easy to share stocks, okay? And again, continuality of life, okay? Even beyond its uh, lifespan. So what does that even mean? This means that if everybody decides to leave the company, the company will still exist even if there's one shareholder left, okay? So that means because remember, the entity... The, the business itself is its own separate entity, right? If Target lost all of its shareholders and there's only one person left, that means Target can still remain, continue its operations until that one person leaves, okay? But that doesn't mean it ends there, right? Because if someone decides to buy that stock from that one person, they can continue the operation as usual, okay? So that is what continuality of life is. Here's a little fun fact here that when a um, company becomes established as an incorporate status, how does that work? It usually goes around by what state that they are going to be establishing corporate status in. So they have to file with the state and it's usually um, where their headquarters are. So again, um, again, Many companies are headquartered in like Atlanta, Georgia, New York, et cetera, et cetera, right? If the headquarter, usually the headquarters is going to be where the state is incorporated in, okay? So that's a little fun fact there, okay? So let's talk about the advantages versus the disadvantages of corporations, okay? Advantage number one is shareholders have limited liability. What does that mean? It means that they are only subjected to whatever amount that they are. Um, they have limited liability, meaning nothing else is at risk. So that means the only thing that they're risking is just the money that they are investing um, into the company, which is part two, which part two, right? I mean, shareholders, if something goes down with the company, the shareholders are not responsible for anything that happens to the company, right? They're only at risk to whatever they invested in. So just the money that they invested to support the company. So again, that means their personal assets are safe. So again, so that's what I'm saying here between the stockholders 
Um, the shareholders have limited liability, meaning they're not responsible for anything that happens to the company. And if they are, they're only, for number two, they're only responsible for just the money that they invested to buy the stock. All their personal assets are safe. Okay, so that's a huge advantage because then if I want to spend $25 on Target to own a share to Target, right, and let's say they take a huge plummet, I only lost $25 and that's it. Okay. Um, number three, okay, um, the ability to raise additional funds through um, sale of stock. Okay. Absolutely, right? If the company needs more money, all they got to do is they got to release more stock out for people to want to own the company, okay? Another best way they, they entice people to want to buy into the company is they release some news saying, hey, take advantage of a stock split where you can buy a ownership of the company, right? You could buy five shares for the price of one stock, right? That is a way to entice people to want to invest into the company to have them give money to the company so they're able to either expand or do something with that money, okay? And of course, the more stocks that you own, the more likelihood that when you get dividends, you'll get more money. So that's a huge advantage to people, okay? Number four, tax deductions for having employees. So yes, as a corporation, because they're so massive, right, they get to take a huge tax deduction for having employees, okay? Now, in this case, I am not a tax, uh, per I'm not a tax accountant, so I can't tell you the details into that, but it is a huge tax de deduction um, for, you know, having employees as a corporation, right? Huge, just huge advantage because again, as a corporation, they're gonna have billions of employees. So of course, right? Billions of employees means the government can take more money. So that means they can have that leeway where they can take a couple of tax deductions for the company itself. Okay. And of course, number five can it can elect between to be taxed as a um, as a S corporation. Now. You're going to hear this terminology very often. What is a C-Corp versus an S-Corp? They're not different entities, okay? So please do not confuse this. The only difference between them is how you want to be taxed, okay? It's not establishing yourself as a separate entity, like an S-Corp is better than a C-Corp. No, 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 no. There's no difference between the two. They're still corporations. The only difference between them is how you're going to be taxed. Okay, so as an advantage, if you choose to be an, taxed at S Corp, right, you're only going to be taxed at the personal income level, okay? That's an advantage because, again, less taxes, less payments to the government, right? However, um, again, if that's the case, you could be subjected to have to pay taxes again at the end of the year, okay? So that's another, that's the thing about taking um, tax deductions is that that's the high possibility that you have to end up paying um, taxes at the end of the year, okay? Um, but as a C Corp, right, you get double taxed. One at the income level, at the personal income level, and the second one at corporate level. So yes, there is a corporate tax that's going to be involved if you choose to be selected as a C Corp, okay? That's the only difference between C Corp and S Corp, okay? Is how are you gonna get taxed, okay? And then again, for the disadvantages, right? Um, again, it is going to require a lot of time and a lot of money to be able to establish yourself as corporate status, okay? In this case, right? You can't be a small business and ask people to invest into your company because they don't know who you are. You have to take time to build your company, to build your brand, to make a name for yourself for people to want to invest into your company. So again, at the end of the day, all businesses are going to start off either as a sole proprietor 
or a partnership, okay? And they eventually will build their clientele list, they'll build the trust, and then they'll build the um, other clientele list for people who are interested in liking the brand and trusting the brand that they want to invest their own money to. So again, it does take time. And of course, if you are willing to just go ahead and have you have a billion dollars in your pocket right now, go ahead. You can go ahead and establish yourself as corporate status immediately, right? But the idea is that if you are doing that, right, you're probably going to be doing a license or a franchise. So you are part of the corporation. But um, at the end of the day, right, you have to have people who want to invest in your company for you to have sustainability. So again, it takes time to become a corporation, okay? Number two, okay, it is heavily monitored by the federal, state, and local agencies, um, okay, because, again, corporations, okay? The reason why we have the government so highly involved in corporations is because of what happened back in the past from the Enron um, situation, okay? Um, if you guys don't know, if guys don't remember who Enron are or don't know, have a clue what Enron is, Enron used to be a major corporation that was in the business of electricity, okay? Before General Electric uh, Electrics was available, they were the leading company for electricity and they frauded the com the government in every type of way and made their books look so clean that, you know, um, eventually they got caught um, and they were frauding their customers, okay? And because of that, because they didn't have the government monitoring their books at all times, that is why because of that happened and they frauded the government, they frauded everybody that invested their money into the company that now it's becoming a regulation for federal state and local agencies for major corporations because we all know corporations right we always think of them as the evil business because a lot of corporations are corrupt because of the billions of dollars that people are trusting into a company right um, and at the end of the day, they may say this, they may say that, but at the end of the day, that is so. That is why um, federal, state, and local agencies are highly monitoring the activity of every corporation, right? And they require those corporations to release their financial statements every quarter. Okay, it is by law. Okay, so there's a lot of government you know, um, involvement in the, in part of, um, corporations. So that's a huge disadvantage because you won't be able to do what you want to do. Okay. And of course, third is going to be higher taxes. If you guys are going to be taxed at the C corp level, which is being taxed at the personal income level and the corporate level. Okay. Any questions here? Okay, next is going to be limited liability companies, okay? So what's the difference between a limited liability company and the rest of the other um, entities that we looked into, right? For instances, those three are the main ones that, you, that we do see most commonly today. In this one, a limited liability is generally a hybrid between a corporation and a partnership okay all right it is not a corporation okay but it um but it is a legal company entity as in it's 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 the company itself is separate from the actual people who own it okay and there cannot uh and they have to choose between two characteristics of a corporation okay so that means a limited liability company must hold at least two of these characteristics right but they actually run functionally as a partnership right so that's why it's a hybrid between a corporation and a partnership because it has two 
key characteristics to establish itself as a limited liability company, but it's being run like a partnership, okay? So that's a huge thing you need to know for a limited liability uh, company, okay? So advantages versus disadvantage. Advantage number one, okay, taxation. They can also choose to be um, taxed at the corporate level for flexibility. So that means they can choose between an S-corp or a C-corp because they are a hybrid. So they have that advantage where they can take advantage of the tax deductions there, okay? They have limited liability, meaning whoever owns the company, they're solemnly responsible to whatever um, investment that they have in the company. That means no personal assets are at risk. So that means limited liability, okay? Number three says they can elect one member to be the entity. So we talked about it's the, the company is separate, right? However, you can choose because it's a partnership, right? You can choose one person to be the entity, okay? Number four, no annual shareholders meeting is required. So again, because, right, if, for instance, this limited liability has a board of directors, right, since it's not technically reliant on these shareholders, right, even though they can have shareholders, they can make the executive decisions themselves. So they don't need to require to have a uh, annual shareholders meeting because the board of directors themselves come from the partners themselves. Okay. And then number five, less administrative work and um, record keeping. So again, this is more, again, um, in regards to uh, building the company, right? Um, it's not going to have as much um, executive or administrative work. Okay. And then number six is going to be membership interest can be assigned, okay? So memberships meaning like, for instance, uh, people who want to be involved, so through um, shareholders, if they choose to have that as a criteria, as part of their, um, one of their uh, characteristics of being, um, being part of the company, right? You can elect certain memberships to be assigned, meaning you can have, tiers right or uh tiers meaning like um groups of individuals right that invest into the company okay so that's what those memberships can do to be assigned oops sorry about that okay so let's talk about the disadvantages of a limited liability companies well again you need to have at least two owners okay because again criteria is it's a it's a combination between a corporation and a partnership. A partnership must have two or more people, cannot be one, okay? So that means you have to have two people involved into this company in order to be a limited liability company. So that's a huge disadvantage, right? You can't do this on your own. Uh, number two says, can have limited lifespan, right? Because if a partner decides to leave, your company is, you know, you won't be able to do much for your company unless you find a new partner because you have to have two or more people involved. May have self-employment tax. So in this case, right, a partnership, we talked about a partnership, right? A partnership is similar to a sole proprietor where you're going to get taxed the same way, okay? And some Again, some if you guys are silent partners, right, you might consider that as part as a self employment type of business, right? Because you're not a you're not a one hundred percent a legal entity, right? You're you're you created a business on your own. So again, that could be tailored under self employment. Okay, so you could be taxed for that. Okay, and of course, if profits exceed fifty percent, it will be taxed by the federal. Okay, so that means if you're generating too much money, you will be subject to federal tax. Okay, and then number five, cannot um, take advantages of stock options. Okay, so again, for a limited liability company, since you own the company, right, unfortunately, um, stock options is where it's an option for when you retire, 
that um, you get to own a part of the company, okay? Um, by, you know, owning um, a few shares of stock. In this case, when you do, when you are in a limited liability company, unfortunately, you cannot own a part of the business for retirement, okay? So no stock options there. And then, um, uh, hold on, hold on. Um, some states, again, can tax LLCs, okay? So, um, again, you're going to have to look at what state that you are going to be creating your limited liability company for. So, you might want to make sure that you do your research to make sure, are you sure you want to do a business in the state of Nevada? And if so, is there taxes for limited liability companies? Yes, go ahead. Question? So um, I am a little bit, I am getting confused, but um, Elon Musk um, not too long ago was talking about making his uh, Tesla into a private company. So how does this public company versus private company falls into this category? Um, so in this case, um, since he already is established as a corporation, that will that will be his executive decision whether he wants to stop having people investing in his company or he can okay. switch to a limited liability company, right, that allows okay. him to become a private slash public because it's a hybrid, right? So he can have those mm -hmm. people invest in his company, but he's going to act as a, a partnership or whatever, you, a limited liability company, right? Where okay. he won't be at risk for anything that happens to that company, right? Okay. But at the same time, he's still willing to um, have those uh, investments come through. Now, that is okay. difficult because I don't know the context of what Elon Musk is doing. I don't know yeah. what it means for him, what in his context of why he wants to go public and go into private. I wouldn't okay. know to answer that question. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's how the news outlet is using a private versus public company. Correct. Right. Public okay. traded companies usually are those major corporations. So a private is more smaller business like a sole proprietor, a partnership. Even a limited liability is a yeah. small private owned. It can be a small privately owned company. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. All right. And of course, last but not least, if you decide to convert yourself from an existing company into LLC status, you can be taxed by the government. Okay. All right. Just because it takes paperwork for you to have to switch from a uh, partnership into an actual limited liability company, right? Um, there's paperwork involved, and on top of that, do you have the necessity, if you choose to have the characteristics of having stock um, holder share, how are you going to have the people outlets to be able to invest money into your company? So again, it takes a lot of work to switch from um, an existing company into an LLC status. Okay. Any other questions here? Last enti last um, type of business organization that we're going to take a look at is going to be non-for-profit organizations, okay? Non-for-profit, non-profit, or whatever way that you guys know it, the main goal of non-profits is straightforward. It has it in its own title, right? They're not there to make money. They are there to spread awareness, okay? They are only sole purpose is to spread awareness, to educate or to have some kind of um, belief about a particular topic or subject that they want to share with the world, okay? These type of organizations, nobody owns it because it's non-for-profit. People must believe or have some kind of or relations to the specific, idea that they're trying to spread awareness on so whether it's educational um professional religious okay for some kind of 
purpose, right? They're only serving to spread or share awareness, okay? So again, nobody owns this entity. It's purely voluntary, meaning people, if they believe in it, they will volunteer their own time and invest their own money if they choose to because they believe in whatever um, topic that they are trying to educate, okay? So again, great example is going to be PETA, not the school PETA, but the animal PETA, right? Protection of the, uh, in the animals, okay? We got Susan G. Komen, which is breast cancer um, awareness. We got uh, Comic Relief, which is for AIDS. We also have the um, St. Jude's Children's Hospital for um, cancer research for children, okay? Make-A-Wish Foundation, Ronald McDonald, you have it all. Those are all considered nonprofit organizations because their only strict policy is to educate or spread some kind of awareness. So that means nobody owns it and it's purely voluntary, okay? Now, again, most of these nonprofit organizations, how do they get established? How do they start somewhere? How do they get the money to be able to run their um, organizations? Well, most of it is usually either funded by the members. They get contributions. So again, many corporations that feel the need to want to contribute back to society by in by you know donating a large lump sum to this organization okay um again a lot of corporations do do that so again they're getting money through there a lot of them are getting uh they do fundraisers so again um for instance the la aids walk right they shut down the whole entire street of la just to spread awareness and raise funds for aids okay so that's a perfect opportunity for them to have sponsors okay people many corp, corp, uh, many corporations or companies sponsor those fun, fundraisers by donating large lump sum monies okay and again federal and state also again they also get money from um, the federal and state as well so again they are being funded by almost everyone else Okay. Again, contributions through donations. And again, they are not in the means to make money. Okay. However, they do sell stuff like, uh, for instance, like they um, create t-shirts. And usually they say, hey, if you buy a t-shirt, you can help spread awareness. And also that money is going to contribute to, you know, research. Okay. Whatever means that they do say, um, again, um, they are not in the means to make money because that money is supposed to, supposedly supposed to go to um, whatever topic that they're going for. For instance, you know, Susan, uh, I mean, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, right? The money is supposed to go to the funding to go into research for, child, for cancer in children, okay? And again, they get special taxes because... They're not making money, okay? So that's the huge thing here is they're non-profit. So how are they going to get special taxes? Well, obviously, donations usually are tax-free, okay? However, depending on, for instance, if they're going to shut down the, the whole street of L.A., they're going to get taxed for that for sure because that's a huge street that everybody needs to go drive through and shutting down that um that street for that time being they have to be subject to pay into taxes for that street so again there's special taxes again for those specific things but this is for nonprofit organizations okay so let's go ahead and dive right into the actual business activities okay so business activities there are three main cores of a business activity okay straightforward number the first one that you normally see is there are companies that are strictly providing services okay so a great example would be an accounting firm right their main speciality is they don't actually sell you a product 
they require their time to either give you professional advice about your business and accounting or they do the accounting work for you. So that is considered a service, okay? Think of any cable company, right? Internet provider, okay? They, they sell you a product, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's the service that they're providing for you is they're giving you the internet service, okay? Um, so that is a service. Now, a merchandising, okay? type of activity is straightforward. It's anything that sells a product. So again, any re retail store, okay? Any retail store you can think of that sells a product. So a clothing store, a grocery store, right? All of them sell products. They don't sell service. They don't sell you, uh, they don't sell you your, your time. They sell you something that you can use um, either whether it's in your household or whatever it is, right? And then another criteria for that, instead of having a retailer, is there's wholesalers. Wholesalers where you can buy in bulk. So again, Costco, Winko, food restaurant, I, Depot, right? All of those are going to be a wholesaler that they sell to either the public or they sell to retail stores, um, but they sell in bulk, right? They still sell the same thing, right? But they're products in large quantities, okay? And of course, the last one straightforward is manufacturing, which is going to be the companies that actually produce those products, okay? So example, a um, auto dealership, right? So you go to, I don't know, let's use Subaru for instance, right? Even though they sell you the car, they're the one that's also making the car. Okay? They're the one that's making the model, building it, whether it's here, um, somewhere in the United States, right? They're building the product, ship it out to the actual auto dealer store, and they sell it to you directly to the consumer. Okay, That is a manufacturing. So again, there are three business activities. Service, providing, um, merchandising, selling a product, and then third is manufacturing, which is creating the product. Okay? So for this class, right, we talked about it in the very beginning of this class that we're going to be focusing on merchandising activities where we're going to be buying our inventory. Our ultimate goal is to sell that inventory, okay? So we're actually, we're not going to make the product, right? Because I'm going to tell you this, if we're going to be making the product, this is going to be a continuation of accounting because that's going to be cost accounting or also known as managerial accounting where you're going to figure out all the costs that are involved to create the product, which no, we're not gonna have time for that because that's gonna be more level advanced of accounting. Right now, we need to focus on the main basics of buying a product and, sell and reselling it to someone else, okay? So let's talk about accounting. What is accounting? Well, here you go, there's the definition here. It's a set of standard procedures, okay? That helps us understand what a business does, right? Through its, what the, through its transactions, okay? Now those transactions can have us collect the data, interpret the data, okay? And be able to understand what this transaction and how it affects a business, right? So this is us looking at financial information and interpreting it and uh, making it in a way that makes sense to us. So what does this really mean? This is gonna help us answer what happened, when did it happen, why did it happen, and how did it happen, okay? Okay, the who, what, where, when, why, except you don't need the who, okay? Who is going to be straightforward? You're going to only have one person that you're going to be, you know, dealing with this transaction with, right? Whether it's a vendor, customer, or employee, right? So who is already given? But what you're doing with this business transaction is you're truly understanding these, five, these four things, okay? Now, what's the purpose of creating financial statements? It's for your internal users and your external users. So once you establish and understand and interpret those financial information and you convert them into those financial statements, 
This is for the sole purposes of people that are involved in your company, right? You want them to know what your company is doing, okay? How they're doing, like are they making a profit? Because you want to ensure the people who are working in your company want to continue to work in your company, right? If you tell them that the company's going down, you already know what's gonna happen, right? So in this case, it is for the sole purposes of the internal user, so they are aware of what to do, especially because the financial information can spark those internal users to either create a better plan, to either boost your profits, boost your sales, okay, and maybe even boost um, your savings, right? Let's cut some costs, okay? Now, for your external user, right, your once you produce your financial statement, the find the external users are going to people are going to be your, the people such as your bank, right? Your investors, right? If they can see your uh, financial statements look really good, right, and they see that when you owed money, you paid it back, this is going to mean that they might have an interest into your company and want to invest into your company, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be just only bank investors. It could be other, other investors, right? Private investors, okay? So again, that's the sole purpose of having and creating financial statements, okay? So let's talk about the difference between the bookkeeper and the accountant. So in this class, we talked about bookkeeping and the accountant, right? Or at least we kind of understand why we're in this class, right? Our goal is to become a bookkeeper. I say, no, I'm going to teach you to not only be the bookkeeper, but to also be the accountant as well, okay? Because this is accounting and bookkeeping, not accounting or bookkeeping, okay? So I'm going to teach you to do the fundamentals of to keep track of a company's income and expenses through bookkeeping. But I'm also going to teach you how to be the accountant who makes up the rules and guidelines for the bookkeeper. Okay. Now, to tell the difference between the bookkeeper and the accountant, I'll tell you this. The bookkeeper has only one job, and that job is to record every business transaction that's it okay that's their sole purpose is just to record those transactions okay so that means they're going to be receiving all these information from every other person in the company right and their job is just to record it okay where the accountant the accountant can do the bookkeeper's job right they can record everything too but their main job is not only do they also record the transactions, they are also the one that's creating the rules. They're creating the guidelines. They're also analyzing the materials afterwards, right? Because they are also sole uh, purpose is to also create financial statements. And they're the one that's going to be interpreting the materials after the math, where the bookkeeper only strictly records. They don't ask any questions because all they need to know is how to record and to and when to record, right? That's it. The accountant does more than that, okay? So by the end of this class, I'm going to teach you to be both the accountant and bookkeeper, okay? All right? So that is what we're going to be doing throughout the next 15 weeks of class. So let's talk about types of accounting, okay? So we have five areas of accounting. So this is the section where I was actually going to be talking to you guys about earlier um, in the very beginning of class is that this class does not stop here, okay? Because if you stop here, you can only do bookkeeping, okay? There are areas of accounting. So accounting is very broad. If you want to expand your knowledge, right, you can go into any of these five areas of accounting, okay? First one is public, second one is private, third is um, government, fourth is nonprofit, and the last one's international, 
Okay. So let's talk about um, public public accounting. Excuse me. Public accounting. Before even stepping foot into public accounting, you need to have a CPA license. <coughs> okay. What is a CPA license? It literally stands for Certified Public Accountant, okay? Because here's the thing. This is for publicly traded companies, meaning you need to be an expert. You need to have a license in order for you to touch anything that has to do with a publicly traded company. And a publicly traded company is going to be a corporation, okay? Because they have so much information, they are also, in terms of being watched by the federal, state, and local agencies, right? You need to be a professional in order for you to be able to even step foot in public accounting. So you need to pursue a CPA. Now, yes, I hear a lot of things where you can intern for a public trading company, but at the end of the day, you are going there to get trained to get a CPA license. Because at the end of the day, no one's going to trust you unless you have a CPA license. Okay? So what, does, what can a public um, accountant do? They can do audit accounting. So again, this is where they take a look at their um, a corporation's past um, financial worksheets, right? And what they do is they just go through it just to make sure that they paid their proper taxes, that they've done all these things correctly. Audit, okay? Straightforward, okay? A huge, huge section for the publicly traded companies is going to be taxation, right? Because not only are you dealing with tax in general, right? Taxes, state taxes, right? You're dealing with federal taxes. You're dealing with employee taxes. You're dealing with corporate taxes. Taxes is going to be a huge section. That's why um, a lot of CPA licensed individuals, most of them actually end up going into the field of taxation, okay? Especially because think about it. If you have a billion transactions every single day, how many people is it going to be needed in order for you to be able to process financial statements in a timely manner? You're going to need a lot, especially for taxes, okay? Even though we all know taxes uh, happen around April or May, right? That's for personal taxes, but for corporate taxes, it's a whole different story, right? Okay, so again, you're going to need a lot of people in the field for taxation because, again, you want to make sure those corporate taxes, when they come in, right, making sure that those corporations don't try to fraud the company, okay? Don't try to do anything to try to get away from taxes, okay? So that's a huge field that you can do with public accounting, okay? And here's an interesting one. I took a class on it. It's called forensics accounting. This is where... You can choose to, if you go into this field, um, you can investigate a company. Because again, right, because of Enron, right, they are the ones who kind of put a ripple in um, the whole accounting field for businesses, right, to ensure that there's no possibility of fraud, especially for a corporation, right? What is a penny to a, comp to a, to a corporation? It's chump change, right? It's, you can easily sweep that under the rug. A penny, right? A corporation is not going to worry about a penny. So that's why those forensics accountants are there to investigate those companies to make sure that every penny is going somewhere, okay? And that they're not sweeping it under the rug. So that's what you can do too. You can also do forensic accounting where you can investigate um, a corporation, a publicly uh, traded company, just to ensure that there is no fraudulent charges going on or um, there isn't uh, missing money anywhere. So that's what's really cool about that area. Okay. Any questions there?
Okay. So now, let's go ahead and move into the private sector. So the private sector, right, is going to be looking at the accounting in a much, much smaller scale, okay? We're talking about small businesses, maybe medium-sized businesses, because as long as you are not corporate status or not a publicly traded company, right, this is for the smaller, more private companies, okay? So in this case, um, there's a lot more things that you can do under the private sector, okay, right? You still have the main three, right? You have the tax accountants, right, for, you know, small, small businesses. So, yes, for this one, you don't need a CPA license for this one, okay, because if you're dealing on a smaller grand scale, then you don't necessarily need a CPA, but a CPA would definitely help you just because tax involves the government, okay? Um, and, of course... You have the auditing, okay? But in this case, it is breaking, it's broken down to even further, right? We have financial accounting, which is exactly what we're learning in this class is what is the fundamentals of accounting? What is the building blocks? What's the start of the fundamentals of accounting, which is financial accounting? This is where you start first is financial accounting because that's going to allow you to understand how to collect how to record, how to analyze, interpret a business transaction, right? Understand why a business transaction does this and how it affects a company, right? And of course, preparing financial statements is should be the 101 for um, accounting in general, okay? We, we did dabble a little bit into managerial accounting, right? This is where you have anal 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 analytical um, uh, for financial data, all right, which is considered cost accounting, budgetary accounting, green accounting. So for those that um, want to go into green resources, so um, solar panels, things like that. Um, so again, that is definitely something that um, is more for manu manufacturing types of businesses where you need to figure out how much it's going to cost you to build a product, right? You need to get your resources at a low, low price, but also how much is it going to cost you to even produce that product, right? You need to figure out those, and that's going to be considered cost accounting, which is actually the next section after financial accounting, right? First, we're going to talk about how you sell a product. Now we're going to talk about how you build a product, okay? And, of course, you have treasury accounting, which is your standard people at the bank, right? So you got your bank tellers, right? The people who um, are your bank investors, right? And of course, you have financial planning and, and analysis accountants, okay? Which um, basically what they do is they analyze your company and they calculate your return on investments, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's under the private sector. So you have a lot more flexibility, when it comes to doing private sector because everything is so tailored to um, a very uh, specific criteria, right? Where corporations, they're kind of combined into one, right? The most things that corporation really do need to focus is those three criteria, right? Um, but in this case, the private sector, right? Because you're building your product, right? You need someone to be able to handle that because you're going to be selling a product, right? You need someone to be able to handle that. Okay, where mostly, um, again, um, the uh, corporate publicly traded companies, they do have all of those, but they're not the main focus of what you would do if you have a CPA license. Okay, where private, you have a little more flexibility. And, and again, for this class, we are focusing on just financial accounting. Okay, any questions here? Okay. All right. Other areas that you can be dealing with accounting is going to be governmental accounting. Okay. So government accounting, what does that involve? Well, this accounting is 
strictly involved uh, for government um, funded programs. So again, budgetary, um, dealing with budgets and things like that, agency funding, distributions, management, things like that. So being able to um, look at a government funded uh, agency, distributing, budgeting things so they have certain sections and when they do their accounting, right, they make sure how much money is being spent on a, a particular resource and so on and so forth, okay? So that's what you can do under government, right? Now, for non-for-profit, like I mentioned before, right, it has a separate tax. So in this case, that's why it is a separate um, area of accounting because, again, you're not going to apply the same taxes or the same um, this, the same type of accounting as you would for a regular business that is in the business for making profits, right? Because they're not trying to generate income. They are using their money for something else, to provide, to donate, right? So you're going to be looking at their accounting a lot more differently than you would for a actual um, profited company, right? So we're going to be looking at things like budgetary, right? Again, they need to be able to manage their money by budgeting, okay? You need to have a funds manager. So again, looking at how to fundraise the money, looking at where the money is going to be coming in from, okay? And last but not least, international. Now, international requires you to not only know the rules of GAAP, but in case for any reason that you uh, that your business decides to go overseas internationally, right? You need to also figure out what the guidelines of their accounting is, right? Because the 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 generally accepted accounting principle is only used in the United States. So that means if you're doing business in Europe, right? You can't be using generally account um, accepted accounting principles because you're going to be submitting your financial statements to the European uh, uh, the European government, right? Not the United States because you're doing business and you're selling and you're making your profits from Europe, not in the United States. So you need to know the rules and regulations beyond the United States. So that it will include foreign currency, right? You need to be able to uh, be able to um, convert the money in a in a uh, in a way, right? Because again, foreign currency, right? They're not identical. They're not equivalent. Even though we have conversions, right? It's not always accurate. So you need someone who's in the professional of foreign currency. You need to have a regional accounting, meaning um, in the areas of where you're um, going to be doing your business in. You need to have, um, you need to be able to know how to manage those regional areas. Okay, and yeah, and again, you need to know the rules and regulations for what their accounting is compared to the United States um, gap, okay? So those are the five areas of accounting. And like I've mentioned before, it's just for you to know. So instead of stopping here at fundamental accounting or financial accounting, right? You can expand your horizons and look into a field of accounting that you are more interested in, okay? So again, that does involve more education because this is just the basic blocks of accounting, okay? Any questions in regards to the five areas of accounting? Okay. So let's talk about financial reports. There are four important financial reports, okay? And this is the responsibility of the accountant to be able to produce these um, statements. Now, these statements will tell you exactly what you need to know about the business, right? First one starting off will be your income statement, okay? Your income statement is going to tell you whether your business is making a profit or not. 
okay? So again, the income statement has many different names. It's also known as the profit and loss report, P&L for short, okay? But at the end of the day, what you're understanding from the income statement is, is your company making a net profit or a net loss, okay? Is your money, is your company making money or is it losing money? So how do we determine that? What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the main core operations, right? How much money is being generated, okay? So that's going to be the first thing that you're going to be putting here. Then you're going to counter them against all of the expenses you have to incur in order for you to operate your business. So a great example is even though you generated all this money, right? You still had to pay rent for the building for you to sell your product. That is going to be considered an operating expense. Utilities, right? The electricity bill. You had to pay it in order for you to be able to um, turn on the lights in your, in your building for you to sell your product, right? You have to incur advertising expense because how is someone going to know they, that our, your product was on sale? Well, you got to distribute some kind of marketing material to entice your customers to come to your store. So those are going to be things that are going to be considered expenses. And what the main goal is, is your generated income enough to cover all the costs it took for you to operate your business? And if you generated more, you'll have a net profit. If you end up spending too much money, then you're going to end up with a loss, okay? And these profits and loss, again, if you're a sole proprietor, you have the choice, right? If you have a profit, you can either pocket it or you can reinvest it into your company. If you take a loss, your company is responsible. Again, you, you, because you own the business, right? That means your money that you invested into the company is going to, um, is going to cover those losses, okay? So that's the most important thing is to determine whether your business is profitable or not. Okay. Second one is going to be your statement of owner's equity. Okay. Now, why is it owner's equity? Okay. In this case, equity is going to be universal for doesn't matter what kind of company you are. Okay. The only difference is what does equity mean? In accounting, equity represents what the net worth or the value of your company is, okay? In other words, if you do your reading, right, it's also referred to your assets minus your liabilities, okay? Which means everything that you own from the company minus everything that you owe for the company to other people is going to be what your, your company's worth. But it's actually beyond, it's actually more than that, okay? Because your equity, right, why is it owner's equity? If you're a sole proprietor, the owner owns the equity. If you're a partner, the partner's equity, meaning it's a shared equity, right? For um, corporations, who owns the company? The shareholder's equity, okay? So at the end of the day, they all represent the same thing, right? What is the total value of your company, okay? And this will include original investment. Capital contributions is where you invest more money okay, apart from your original investment, okay? Owner's withdrawal is where you take away money from your company, so that's going to decrease. And if you choose to reinvest your money into the company, then you're going to add any net profits, right? But if you took a loss, that is going to be taken away from your equity. So at the end of the day, what this represents is what is your true value of your company? So in this case... Right. If you started out the company with um, twenty with two thousand dollars, right, and you added this, but you some you took some money out, then at the end of the day, you're going to uh, either increase or decrease the value of your company. So that's what the statement of equity does. Okay. Next one's going to be your balance sheet, which is going to determine this. It's going to determine whether your accounts are balanced, right? Balanced to what? It's going to be balancing the accounting equation, okay? The accounting equation is going to be your assets. It's going to be equal to your liabilities 
plus your equity, okay? This is the true accounting formula, okay? Another word for accounting formula is your equity equaling your assets minus liabilities. But, again, we talked about that. That's not always true because equity, right, has other components. It has your, um, your income, right? It has other things. So that's not always 100% true. However, your assets, which is everything that you own in the company, should be equal to everything that you owe to other people plus the value of your company. That's how we understand assets equal liabilities plus equity, right? Okay, so that's the accounting equation that we are focused and that's what we use the balance sheet for is to test the accounting equation, okay? And what we're testing is to make sure that our accounts are balanced, okay? And last but not least is going to be the statement of cash flow. So what does the statement of cash flows actually do? In this case, straightforward, right? It literally is taking a look out of your main core of operations, right? And it categorizes based on them on three criteria. Operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities, okay? So again, what the statement of, of cash flows does is it's actually a combination between your um, income statement and your balance sheet, okay? It's a combination between the two because what happens is what it's actually really doing is it's actually taking a look at all the money, right? And it's actually looking at how much of that money that you generated income from is actually cash. So what we're looking is how much cash is actually flowing into the company and how much cash is actually flowing out from the company, right? When you pay your bills, right? How did you pay your bills? You had to have money. So in this case, that's what it's looking at. It's looking at how much cash is actually flowing into your company and how much is actually flowing out from your company. Again, we will get to the opportunity to complete all four statements but we won't do that until the very end of the accounting course okay so you at least need to know what these four accounting uh financial statements do okay internal control so oh wait, sorry any questions in regards to the financial statements okay these financial storm statements Yes, there is a particular order that must be completed, but I won't talk about that until, again, the last week of class. So any questions in regards to the financial statements? No, okay, let's keep moving on then. Internal controls, okay? So internal controls, what, do this, what does this do, okay? So if you guys remember, the reason why we have internal controls is because of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, okay? And again, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act happened because of the infamous Enron Company, right? They did so many uh, violations, so many, so many things that they did to their financial books and statements to make them look clean, okay? To make sure that they look like they are making a huge profit and that they are um, pretty much um, a really good company to invest in, okay? But they end up frauding not only the federal government, but they end up frauding their customers and the people who invest into their company, right? So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act basically says that when you have a company, you must maintain a system that has an internal control, meaning you have to have more than one person involved in a transaction, okay? So think of it like a hierarchy, right? 
in order for a, in, so you have the president at the top, then you have the VP, then you have the treasurer, then you have everybody out under them, right? In order for a transaction to be fully processed, it must go up the chain of command and make sure that the president gets verified and notifies you that, okay, we authorize that this transaction is valid and can be proceeded, right? Why else do you think paychecks, right? The HR can't just sign the paychecks, right? It's got to be the president because the president has to verify each and every single check and they must sign it off, okay? And that's due to the internal controls, okay? So that means the HR cannot write themselves a check, right? They can't pay themselves a lump sum money because who is going to be cut, who's, who is actually at the end of the day going to be signing off those checks? It's the president. So therefore, two people are involved, right? The HR just simply process the pe paycheck, process the payroll, gets the paycheck ready, and the president has to authorize it, verify it, and sign the check, okay? So that's the purpose of having internal controls is you have a chain of command. It must go through all the chains of command for a transaction to become valid to prevent fraudulent charges from happening, okay? So again, it was all due to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, okay? All right, so that was chapter one, okay? Here is the quick review for chapter one, right? We got the, um, the what is the nature of a business, right? The ultimate goal is to take resource, natural resources to create a product or service to provide for consumers, okay? We have the five business um, organizations, right? A sole proprietor versus a partnership versus a corporation, limited liability company, and a non-for-profit, okay? Now, what I want you to get away from this is that know the difference between them. I don't expect you to know the disadvantages or the advantage of them because those lists can go beyond and beyond and beyond, right? In this case, I just need you to know what the difference is between them. So again, the difference between a sole proprietor and a partnership is you need two people in order to be a partnership, right? Where a sole proprietor, there's only one owner, right? That's all I need you to know, the difference between the different organizations, okay? And then we talked about the different business activities, right? Service, manufacturing, and merchandising, okay? The difference between the bookkeeper versus the accountant. What is accounting? We talked about the financial statements and the five areas of accounting, okay? These don't give you definitions. These just give you what they are, okay? So it's your job to be able to kind of figure out what they are, right? Pretty straightforward, right? What is a service activity compared to a merchandising activity? That should be self-explanatory, okay? But for this case, that's all I really want you to get away with is this is what I want you to just kind of have the back of your head. Again, you have this as a review sheet for you to be able to use on the exam and quizzes. Okay? Any questions in regards to chapter one? Nope. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and spend the last couple minutes of class here to go ahead and complete the in-class exercises, okay? So, starting here, okay, um, question number one, what is the nature of a business? That you need the basic resources, mm -hmm. such as materials, a labor to produce goods or provide services to customers. Excellent. To, produ to produce uh, products and services. Excellent. Okay. What else? What is the, what is the purpose? What is the nature of a business? What's the ultimate goal?
to maximize the profits. Yes, to maximize some max profits and max out on savings. Okay, excellent. Okay, number two, what are the five types of business organizations? Yes. Uh, they are a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. Sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. A partnership. Partnership. A corporations. A limited liability company. A nonprofit organization. Excellent. Corps. Um, uh, LLC. So limited. I guess. I guess. I, I have to say, limited. Uh, liability um, company and non-profit. Excellent. Okay. All right. Question three is, can you give me an example of each of those business organizations? So, for example, can you give me an example of a sole proprietor? Donut shop in the neighborhood. Yes, a mom and pop donut shop. Yes, most of them are small family owned businesses. Perfect. Okay, what about a partnership? Charities. Charities is more for. A lot of lawyers. Lawyers. Lawyers are generally partnerships. Excellent, right? Lawyers are generally partnerships. Yes, they are, but they are also limited liability. Okay. So good. Lawyers, law firms. Okay. What is an example of a corporation? I gave you guys a, quite a few. Target, Walmart. Target, Walmart. Excellent. Okay, Apple, um, Tesla, okay, what about a limited liability company? Now, this is a hard one. Um, I noticed that, um, I like to watch NBC, mm -hmm. North North Broadcasting Company, they are actually limited a corporation, or the company. Oh, okay, awesome, so, uh, NBC. Yeah, the very end when they closed the like a morning news, mm -hmm. they chose. They, I was surprised. I bring to their corporation, but they were LLC. Oh, cool! That's that's really cool. I did not know that. Now, most cases, like just exactly what you said, they usually disclose that they are an LLC. So the you're always gonna see LLC behind the name, right? You're always gonna see Target Incorporated, right? You're always going to see something like that. Or like, for example, right? You're always going to see um, Asher and Smith LLP, right? They're always going to have some kind of way to establish themselves as these business organizations. So again, um, um, Abraham, you said uh, for charities, charities is going to fall under um, nonprofit. Okay. Can you give me an example of a charity that you know? Um. I forget the children's hospital thing, not, uh, I forgot exactly what it's called, but they, uh, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. They uh, <laughs> help children and they make fun of, like, the children's hospital. Yeah, so say, I believe it's called St. Jude's, right? You have St. Yeah. Jude's, you have Make-A-Wish Foundation, right? They're also for children, too, Make-A-Wish. Um, and then you also have Toys for Tots, right? It's also for children. Okay, good. Charities. Awesome. Number four, okay, what are the three types of business activities? Services, merchandising, and manufacturing. Crap, Good, <laughs> excellent, right? <laughs> merchandising and manufacturing, right? You need to be able to produce the product for you to be able to sell the product. Good. Manufacturing. I'm having a hard time typing today. All right, next right here, what is accounting? Accounting is the process of collecting, recording, 
and analyzing data. Excellent. Transactions. Right. It's almost every ING word, right? You got recording, you got analyzing, you got collecting, all right, interpreting. Financial data. Okay, financial data information. Okay, um, understanding what a business transaction does. Okay, number six. What are the five areas of accounting? Yes. Uh, it is public accounting. Right. Private. Okay, good. You said public, private. Uh huh. Government accounting, nonprofit accounting, and international accounting. Good. Okay, good. Number seven. What are the four financial statements? Doesn't matter what order. Income statement. Income statement. Good balance. Statement of Statement of owner's equity and cash flow. Good. Okay. Statement of cash flows, whatever way that you know it, cash flows. Okay. And then last but not least, question number eight. What is the difference between a bookkeeper and the accountant? Yes. The bookkeeper records and puts in all the transactions. They do the data work. And um, an accountant does that as well as interpreting and analyzing it. Okay. And then the accountant, accountant, um, book keeps as well as um, analyze. What else? What else do they do? What's the most important thing that they do? Uh, the task prepare is to financial information and prepare financial statements. Pre to collect the data and provide interpretations of the data. Excellent. Prepare financial statements is what I was looking for. Good. Right, and they make the rules of the account for the bookkeeper to um, be able to record the transactions too. So they play a huge role in a lot of the um, bookkeeping role, okay? Excellent job. So again, these answers, it's not going to be these answers particularly. They're going to be actual ones with the actual definitions on there. I will post them in the same folder as where you found these. So there you go. You can use these 